across the UK, in every corner of the country, in our hospitals, our high streets, and our households. The coronavirus crisis has altered our lives in a way we could never have imagined, and probably forever. I've spent a lot of my career covering wars all over the world. Now I'm back in Britain, which is on a war footing and facing the biggest threat to the nation in generations. But in this battle against this pandemic, there is fear, but also grit and guts and a lot of humanity on Britain's home front. Warrington a town equidistant from and overshadowed by Liverpool and Manchester, its bigger metropolitan neighbours in northwest England. The very unkind might call it unremarkable in almost every way, except after nearly a fortnight in this town, we found some pretty remarkable people doing a remarkable job. At the town's heart is a single district hospital, the command center of the area's battle against this global enemy. It's the nerve center of the community right now, as they fight a deadly disease we hadn't even heard of a few months ago, but which is pulling people together in a way we couldn't imagine. Welcome everybody to the COVID safety response. The manager's morning meeting. They're constantly trying to stay one step ahead of this disease. That means continually sourcing enough PPE their personal protective equipment. It looks like we've got about four to five days worth of gowns at the moment. They've never run out of PPE here. They believe their smallness helps, but they've come close. The hospital's intensive care unit has more than doubled in size, spilling over into adjoining rooms. These are those most seriously ravaged by coronavirus. Medical staff from all different departments have been redeployed here to the health front line. We're getting a unique insight into the workings of this hospital, where the staff feel they're at war, and in this anteroom to ICU, they're getting their battle dress. Everyone going into the high-risk areas, including our team, is individually fitted for masks to keep them safe. Mold it to your face. It needs to be so that you're not feeling that nothing can get in. I'm going to pop that over your head like so. They insist we use their PPE. We donate ours to the hospital in return. If the standard masks don't fit, then individually crafted ones are ordered. Dr. Mark Forrest heads up the ICU. The small hospital team realized early on as the virus swept in from China and across Europe that they needed new tactics if they were going to win this war. This is one of our patients that's in at the moment. And actually, that's what his x-ray looked like about six to 12 months ago. So that, that's this man fitting well. That's when the man first presented with his COVID pneumonia. And now, after we've treated him and he's been ventilated and he's started to recover, and this is the one today, where you can see, although there's still lots of white shadowing, it's nowhere near as dense as it is on this. You can see now we're getting back some of the grayness, the blackness within mm. the actually, which is more aeration of the tissues. And so it's still far from normal, but that, that picture, the now, man is now off the ventilator. The mortality rates of COVID patients put on ventilators is shockingly high. Most don't leave here. It's a traumatic, invasive treatment, inserting a tube into the lungs under general anaesthetic, with the ventilator doing the breathing, but the patient still needs a very high level of care. The ventilator often leads to the buildup of fluids in the lungs. That then needs to be continually removed. They're getting quite a lot of thick, sticky secretions 
um, especially a few days kind of into being ventilated, um, and they're needing a lot of encouragement to move that, that secretion. The longer a patient's on ventilation, the greater the chances of side effects, as well as the loss of muscle mass. And the doctors are finding COVID patients are just not responding quickly. With COVID, we often get patients that are sort of stuck, that are, that are still needing 70% oxygen, 60-70%. Every day they go up a little bit, they come down a little bit, they go up, but they're stuck. They're not really getting better. And we always think you have to be getting better all the time. But in COVID, there's a suggestion, and I don't know if it's true, but there certainly seems to be a suggestion you should give people at least a couple of weeks of ventilation. You can't give up on people too early. You should at least see it through its course. The team here realised keeping patients off ventilators had a much higher chance of success. We meet Donna in the same ICU, but not ventilated. She's awake and able to talk. Hi Donna, sorry to see you in this position. How, how are you getting on? I just needed help. I couldn't leave by myself. It's very really difficult. But I'm getting better now. I can feel it's working. You didn't go on a ventilator. You must have been worried about that prospect, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. Luckily, I've, I've not had to. Just try not to panic. Do what they're telling me to do. To get me off, breathing back to normal. And uh, it's been better. Why didn't you want to go on a ventilator? I didn't, I didn't want to be out of it. And I didn't know if I'd wake up if I did. She came here three days earlier on her birthday, and she's desperate to live. That's what I want to do. Um, to get home for my children. My family. Yeah. So I'm going to be determined. I don't want to be a statistic of this. I want to go home to my children. My family. She's made astonishing progress because of this, a black box normally used at home for sleep disorders. These have been modified by the medics with oxygen added and a sophisticated mask fitted, but it's pumping air in. In medical terminology, a CPAP machine. So basically we've got two um, because they're meant to be only used for kind of a 12 hour stint. So we swap them between 12 hour shifts just to make sure that the battery's okay. Um, it simply gives PEEP so it gives that end, when the patient breathes out, it basically helps to keep their airways open. The hospital only has a handful of expensive CPAPs and there's been a global demand for them. So the medics modified all the spare black boxes they had in store from the sleep disorder clinic and in one sweep, the number of patients they could help with their modified CPAPs went up by nearly 600%. Everyone in ICU is hovering between life and death, and coronavirus is savage and sudden in its attack. Most are frightened. So well, really, really well. The role of the nurse is critical, and Caroline's come out of retirement to help. Those on ventilators are usually heavily sedated. They're often in ICU longer, or they don't make it at all. Their nurse is a pivotal figure. She's giving constant reassurances with a touch sometimes with a look, always by the bedside. Whatever um, conscious level a patient has, um, there's always the last element that ever leaves a patient is their, their ability to heal. Obviously, this patient you know, is a little bit more conscious than um, a lot of patients I look after. So what were you saying? I was, I was, she couldn't even make herself known, but you no, seemed no. to know she, what she, she was she, saying. She sound, to me, she looked as though she wanted to get out of bed, and, you know, she, she's a very determined woman, and she wants to go home, she wants to be with her dogs and her family. And so I was just reassuring her that, you know, she would get there, and I, I think she probably will, but she, she just has to be patient.
When we rejoin Mark, he's working on another patient's lungs, which are filling up. Our main objective is to get some more secretions off the chest. I'm basically hoovering out the lungs. But this is probably about the highest risk procedure uh, that we can do, intubation being the other one where we put the tube in. He is, however, convinced their approach here, using their modified black boxes, have made the difference at Warrington. I think, from our point of view, it's kept people off ventilators, so it's undoubtedly made a significant difference to us. Um, how many we've actually saved with it, how many... We, there's a lot of patients going back to the ward that haven't needed to escalate up, so it's, significant, it's a significant difference. We won't know the true numbers until we start to look at data and everything afterwards and share it with other units that have done similar things. But no matter the effort, no matter the skill, this disease is claiming its victims, and some they simply cannot save. Ali Crawford is the nurse in charge of emergency care. Her team remember the patients they've lost by hanging a rainbow dedicated to each one on a tree in their ward. Are there tough choices, though? Absolutely. It's not an easy decision, no matter who, what age. And if you've got another comorbidity or an illness that's underlying that and your lungs aren't working anyway, it's, it's going to be really difficult. And I think it's, it's even worse to prolong something that's the inevitable would happen anyway. Weeks into this crisis, there are tributes and thank yous for those on the coronavirus front line. But for NHS staff, the heartache of these difficult decisions is hard to live with. Britain's coronavirus deaths keep on reaching new, more shocking milestones. There can be few places left in the country untouched by the finality of this disease. These are sobering moments for all, and in Warrington, the virus which appears inescapable is also the binding glue for the community. While most of the UK is largely at a standstill, there's constant work for those in the business of death. In one of Warrington's family-run funeral companies, it's non-stop. So we're doing 11 and 12 hour days here every day. And then we're still on call throughout the night. And, and this time last week, out of hours, we were called out four times. Everything's up in the air for everyone, isn't it? But we just adapt and we get on with it. And we're there for the bereaved families when they need us. It's a hard job anyway. It it's is. just got a whole lot harder. It is. Um, and it has got a lot harder, hasn't it? All yeah. exhausted just for the sheer number of hours yeah. and funerals we're doing, but it's a small price to pay for what we do. They have to go to extreme lengths to protect themselves. With PPE, they've bought themselves and sourced themselves. We've warned them in, the, in advance that we will be wearing full PPE, um, just so it doesn't frighten them, because it does look a bit scary if you're wearing a full face mask to remove a loved one. It's, you know, it will frighten them. And you look at your son, sometimes they'll look at you as if it's over the top, maybe. They aren't following any guidelines. They decided this is what they had to do long before anyone thought about the risk to undertakers. There's fanatical cleanliness enforced everywhere. The bodies are sealed in fridges, which are constantly full. In the two fridges, we've got uh, capacity for eight deceased. And how many are full at the moment? Uh, we've got six out of the eight spaces. Uh, at the moment, uh, we've only got uh, two available, um, which we always try and keep for tonight when we're on call. We've got Are you expecting that to, to be filled again yeah, tonight? Definitely. That will 
I'd be, I'd be very surprised if we don't bring at least one more deceased in. Once the bodies are loaded into coffins, those are sealed. But still, nothing's taken for granted. Even the outside is disinfected again and again. Do you think these are all COVID? related deaths? Um, some of these are COVID deaths, yes. The viewing rooms are full. This was where families could once say their final goodbyes. But the virus makes it too dangerous now. There's two coffins in this one, okay. ready for the next funeral as well. Because the funeral director's job has changed beyond recognition but they are perfectly positioned to gauge the real impact of this killer virus. How much more the COVID deaths are than what the official figure is, from just from your evidence? At least double. Uh, I would say we're close to double, mm -hmm. to the hospital numbers. It has to be. Well, we can only speak for our area, obviously, what we're seeing in care homes and in the community. But for us, it, it'll be as many in the community deaths as it is being reported at Warrington General Hospital at the moment. Mm. Do you find that shocking? I think, I think we're both a bit shocked at why these numbers haven't been added to the total. People are talking about it now, but we realised this three weeks ago, yeah. that this was, this was happening, and we were telling our loved ones, our families that we can't even go and see, stay safe, this, this is worse than it's being reported. This is their job, their livelihood, and it's done with even more pride now. The service they offer is curtailed by coronavirus, but the same care is taken and the same respect to the dead is shown. Silence outside Warrington Hospital. Remembering all those health workers who haven't made it through this pandemic. They stand here knowing it could be any of them. And almost certainly everyone here knows somebody, a relative, a friend, workmates who've been struck down by COVID-19. It's a challenge for them all, even Ali, with all her years of experience. Let's go see little chicken. Give you a read. Inside the hospital, in the emergency department where Ali is lead nurse, life and death goes on. I've just heard him coming out to the She's permanently worried about her team, who are feeling very vulnerable. Absolutely terrifying, and it's the fear of the unknown. You're a nurse, you're leading your team, but it's around about you become a 24-7 counsellor. Her emergency department is divided into two now, the hot clinic, where the COVID patients go, and the cold, where all other emergencies are treated. Yeah, do you want to turn your camera on? It's on. Yeah, so... Ali's a mother of two herself and a maternal figure to her colleagues, and she worries endlessly about them being in the line of fire. Thanks, Rach. You're completely worried sick. Worried sick. Almost like a lamb to the slaughter. You feel like you're sending them in, and you don't know who's going to come out. You know, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. It is. I look through that glass and I peer up through that glass with such admiration. You know, a lot of young nurses have just come back from maternity leave and I look at them in their full FFP3 and their kit, full PPE, and I'm thinking all the time, I've got a baby at home, they've got a baby at home. Just nothing but admiration for the team. But the fear of COVID is deterring those who still need urgent help. You said before you were a bit worried about coming in. 
I was scared. What was you scared of, my love? Well, with the coronavirus and okay. that. I was just... Yeah. Just for, I think everyone is, aren't we? Yeah. So... The hospital has set up its own team of COVID cops. Their security guards usually employed patrolling the grounds. But now they're entrusted with keeping patients safe and the virus separate from the rest of the hospital. They lock down corridors, barricade doors, the call signs on the move. and secure a route to take the COVID patient up to a coronavirus ward as quickly as possible. I love this. Love getting involved and helping out. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to do this for the NHS. So, yeah, yeah. How do your family feel about you doing it? They're very proud of me. So I've got little children, so they're loving it. But in some jobs, it's hard to shield yourself against the virus. Julia's a midwife who thinks she caught it at work and knows she's only alive because of the love of strangers. I came in on Sunday in an ambulance, really unwell, felt terrible. I honestly didn't think I'd be going home. Um, they've been brilliant. They've been really brilliant. So my children have come to pick me up and I just can't explain how it makes me feel. Every person who walks away from these COVID wards is considered a success story, perhaps even more so when it's a fellow health professional. And Julia's only 32, a single mum bringing up three young children on her own. And grateful for hugs she never thought she'd have again. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. You must have missed them an awful lot. So much. She left behind a letter in tribute to the staff who saved her. Thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart for everything you have done for me from the moment that I arrived onto the ward. I made my peace and said goodbye to my children and then I came to you. From the second I arrived, I have had nothing but the best care. You came as strangers and I leave here as someone who will never forget the angels that saved her life. The coronavirus is leaving its scars everywhere, but creating bonds way beyond the hospital. Hidden away on a trading estate on the outskirts of Warrington. A small band of people from the town's Sikh community are busy breaking down barriers. Whilst most of the town's sleeping, they've been awake since dawn conjuring up hundreds and hundreds of free meals for Warrington's hospital workers. So we've been at it since six o'clock this morning. And how many hours is it now? So that's a good, uh, what time is it now? 10 o'clock, so a good four and a half hours. Some have relatives working at the hospital or stationed around the country, but others have no connection with the hospital at all, apart from they too might need their services sometime. They just want to do their bit to help. National Health Services are working really hard. They're risking their lives to save our lives, so this is our little effort. But these selfless acts of generosity, with donations from hundreds of Sikhs, are building bridges in this community. Me and my wife, we know we've been living here in Appleton a long time. We've never seen any around it, so like now we go for a walk, we meet our neighbours, which we've never seen before. Many have suffered discrimination in the past, but coronavirus is pulling people together and setting a template of hope for the future. It's a fight at the moment. It's a fight, and the biggest people who are fighting, they're fighting the National Health Service. Hence, we felt we needed to do something, to appreciate what they are doing. And if you don't serve people when they are in need, there's no point serving anybody. 
Yeah. It's great. It's a great, great way to live your life. They pray apart but together, giving thanks for the opportunity to help their wider community in this period where many, including them, feel threatened. Yeah, go on, fire away. A plumber who's put his business on hold is lending his van for the meal deliveries. Yeah. Does it help build bonds, you think, between communities and different people? Oh, definitely, definitely. Me, the Sikh community, the Hindu community, yeah, you know, everyone is helping everyone out and that's what they should be doing anyway. Not just because of the virus. Everyone should be helping everyone on a daily basis anyway. Many here didn't even know the Sikh temple existed. They do now. It's always scorching by the time we get it there. It's not really cooled down much, it doesn't, I don't think it gives them chance. From the fear and panic of a pandemic, fresh friendships have been forged oh, wow. and lasting respect created. You know, you can come anytime. You know. The Sikh temple's been here, you know, 20 years we've been here. We, we, we get a lot of... Uh, People come in there on Tuesday for meal. You know, if you like, the police comes in now and then. But even after the corona, please visit one day. Yeah. You're most welcome, you know. Yeah, I think we definitely need to keep the loop going and hopefully we can help them and they can help us and vice versa. So I think that'd be really nice. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. It's amazing how you come and do jobs like this and in the middle of all this despair, you always find really inspiring people. It's nice to put a smile on everyone's faces and it's amazing. Food just lights everyone up, doesn't it? It's, it's nice. So anyone that's not, uh, not to just appreciate could you just <laughs> Thank you. Newborn, newborn examination. The coronavirus might stop many activities, but it can't hold back babies. Charlotte's birthing plan had to be entirely rewritten. Her father was by her side at the birth. He filmed this most intimate of family moments for Charlotte's partner, who missed his son being born because he's in a vulnerable category at higher risk of catching the virus. I can't believe that. Can you? It's like he's twist. He watched the birth live by video call, making do by comforting his new son over the phone. Oh, God. Okie dokie. When I, I asked the questions at the consultant appointment, um, I just sort of expected them to be like, yeah, it's fine, you can come into theatre, it's really sterile. But they obviously pointed out that there was a lot of more people in a, in a theatre environment and the safest place for him was at home. So obviously having to go home and tell him that he can't see the birth of his baby, it was... It was it was sad and distressing for all of us, but it's just something that you're going to have to do. A tiny bundle born into a strange world at the moment held ransom by a virus which kills. His first few years will be dominated by COVID-19. Now home and finally with his newborn son, Richard's looking on the positive side. Obviously, I feel like I've missed out because I wasn't there, but... <laughs> It's sort of, like I said, it's, it's just the, I had to make the best of a bad situation. I, I'm just really thankful that they let me video, that they let yeah. us, me be there by a video link. There's a much wider health impact of coronavirus. It has emptied waiting rooms. It's led to a slew of cancelled appointments and is deterring people from seeing doctors. Far fewer people are turning up for life-saving treatment. but Ernie Burns, who's got cancer, isn't one of them. It's going to take more than a deadly virus to deter him from his treatment. Just one bag. Yeah. OK. How, how long does that normally take? Three hours, this one. Three hours? Okay, can I just clean your hands? Others are not so brave, though, and are staying away or putting off getting help altogether. 
but at 87 years old, Ernie's more concerned about being split from his family. What are your worries generally about coronavirus? Because we know that it affects elderly people well, more. I, I, I know that my wife and I are doing everything that we can to our, do our share of preventing the spread of it by isolating ourselves. But of course, I, I miss my grandchildren as well. I haven't been able to hook with them or anything like that. But a long, long time, and I miss them terribly. Before this thing struck me, I used to love going out to a restaurant or something like that for a family meal. That used to be the highlights of my week. And most weeks, I was able to enjoy that sort of thing. But not, not since this terrible thing has been plaguing us, this coronavirus thing, it, it was awful. Um, I do hope we get over this in this country. Because there must be thousands and thousands of people just, just like me. Who miss the normal life. Life's been put on hold for so many. Entire hospital buildings, normally packed with patients, are empty. The staff are all battling coronavirus, non-essential treatments being cancelled, and Britain is left wondering when and if life will ever be the same. The coronavirus crisis is global, but it is so very local too. In Wuhan, Washington and Warrington, we all have the same fears and we're dealing with the same dangers. And even when there's no safe place to run to, there are those who confound. We went back to ICU to find Donna, who days earlier had told us through her oxygen mask how she didn't want to be a statistic. Her condition astonishes us. Hello, Alex. Oh, my goodness, you look so different. Yeah, do you think? Yes, you look very different. <laughs> how are you feeling? I'm feeling so much better. I'm so much happier. You know, I'm getting there and my smell's coming back, my taste is coming back. Well, they said you're, you're, you're going to be leaving ICU. I mean, that's an incredible moment. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. When I came in on Monday, I did not think I would be leaving here this way. I really didn't. What did you think? I was so scared. I just thought, I might die. But I'm not going to cry because they've looked after me so well and they've really done their best. Nothing's been too much tr trouble. They've explained everything to me and I'm just thankful to each and every one of them for helping me to fight this and get me back to my children, my family, because I miss my boys so much. I do, I miss my boys so much. I even miss work. I didn't think I'd ever say that, but it would be nice to get back to normal and normal life, you know. Her family was always important, but somehow her close call has made them even more so. Whilst we're with her, she's told she's going in the next few minutes. 
That's such good news. Yeah. We'll have to we'll have to get you there now because we're expecting more people. You've done extremely well though, haven't you? You'll be fine on the ward, won't you? Absolutely fine. So I'm gonna ring security now to lead the way. Okay. How are you feeling about that, Donna? Well, I didn't expect that. That's amazing news. Yeah, I didn't know. It's time for her to make way for others fighting the same coronavirus battle. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for everything. Thanks for looking after me. The bond between carer and those who've come so close to death is a shared one. <laughs> and so is the sheer joy at leaving ICU another step closer to being home with her boys. This is a 24-hour battle, and it doesn't stop. No role or task is unaffected. Did you ever think you'd be, like, no. on the front line <laughs> of a pandemic? No, never in a million years. No. Success in this arena is judged solely on survival. But the coronavirus is leaving deep wounds, both physical and emotional. Harold was in ICU just the day before. Hi, wife. His wife, Christine, was fighting for her life at the same time in a different part of the hospital. Their reunion after such frightening twin experiences is all the more emotional. Tell me how you're feeling, Harold, physically and emotionally. We're getting there. A lot better than we were when we came in. Yeah. <coughs> physically, I'm drained. I didn't think I'd be leaving. Really? Yeah. I was uh, that bad. Just take it out of you, it really takes it out of you. And, oh, I don't know, just everything just goes through your head, the emotions. We were both so poor, we couldn't look after each other at home. And then we just couldn't get downstairs to eat either. So, yeah, it's been a bit of a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're, doing, we're doing it. Yeah. We're getting home. <laughs> we're going home together. Mm -hmm. But beneath the emotion and relief, anger is beginning to bubble. I'm not really a political type person. I'm not really into politics. But uh, the way the government just kept cutting and cutting and cutting at the National Health Service, and then all of a sudden they're, they're singing the praises and then this, that and the other. If they hadn't cut them so much in the first place, maybe they'd have been better prepared for this. Thank you, everyone. These are glimmers of hope. Each survivor's journey so different in detail, yet reminiscent in sheer relief. She's got a bit of colour in her cheeks and smiling and things. <laughs> She's a lot better, but you're still breathless and that. Can't carry baby upstairs, so. A few days after we saw her leave hospital, Julia's exhausted, and Kath, her mother, has moved in to help. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. Is that still a leftover from...? Yeah. I find that I get, if I do too much, really breathless, um, quite a hacking cough, and I just get waves of where I'm exhausted and can't even get out of bed. She's also had critical help from a network of neighbours who are sensing a fundamental shift. How, how important has the community become, do you think? It's a lot more important, and I think this will change people's attitude in the same way that World War II changed people's attitude toward everybody else. The emotional trauma has been huge. Julia told her mum she was dying and made final preparations whilst waiting for the ambulance. She wrote three letters, one for each of her children. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness me. That is incredible. What did you say to them? I had different things to all of them. I just told them how much I loved them, how proud I was of them, how they'd done amazing things in their lives, and I knew that they'd continue to be amazing, and how they'd helped me so much, and that 
I couldn't have ever asked for better children than I've got. It just, I came home and I never expected to. Kath is unaware of the letter she left behind for the nurses, and Julia reads it out. Dear staff of A7, you stood over me like guardian angels when my temperature wouldn't settle. And despite the masks, your kindness and love shone through your eyes. I hope your management can see how you are taking broken, frightened people who have accepted that the time is here and spinning that round to give them a second chance, a whole extra go at life. I know you're all frightened and unsure of what is to come, but the hope you spread is some tough medicine and your love for each other and for us as patients is unmeasurable. Thank you forever. We were very I can't upset speak. I just can't speak. Oh. The worst experience of my life. <laughs> For Julia and those who love her, the experience has highlighted what's valuable. When you become any element of health worker, be it a home carer, um, all the way up to the top of managing a hospital, you do it because you love what you do. You don't ever go into a job like that for the money or, or for the respect or anything like that. You do it because it's part of you and it's instilled inside of you as a person. Thank you, NHS. I'm going home to my boy. Donna's finally going home. Another survivor, all strangers, but all enjoying the same excitement at leaving, and all just a little bit stunned they've somehow made it. This pandemic's plunged the entire world into a crisis, of different degrees, undoubtedly. but we're all enduring it one way or another. Warrington is like so many towns and communities up and down Britain. Of course, they're different, they're unique, they've got their own individuality, but they're also all the same. Everyday people in everyday communities coping with some quite extraordinary times and doing it with incredible fortitude. there's a new love affair with the NHS. The Pipers in Warrington are a regular feature outside the hospital now. Enthusiastic appreciation for those risking their lives inside. It's replicated around Britain. The official talk is all military terminology of foot soldiers, front lines, and the home front. But once the clapping stops, as in any war, there'll be questions to those in command about tactics, propaganda, and collateral damage. It takes nothing away from those fighting this disease. But the survivors you've heard from are those who lived. The questions later, might center around how many more could have been saved.